just uh, preparing my session, and then I wanted to just share you, with you my setup. Uh, I have a double screen on my laptop over here, but it's a bit far away, so uh, the screen is up there. I'm going to be standing over here, so I have the iPad actually showing both screens at the same time, so I know where I am in the presentation, uh, which is pretty nifty. Jag har lagt ut den om man har redan så det finns att ladda den. Jag tror att, att den är de vill samla ihop på ett sätt som du kunde skicka över den. Det är Absolut. Ska jag se att du finner dina alla? Mm. Jag har sett mobilarlarmet på vibrationsläget så är det så lite diskretare.
Jag fortsätter ändå. Du klarar utan. Ja. Nej, nej, de, jag ska få en volunteer att uh, rikta, rikta den mot mig. Jaha, kanske jag då. Ja, men du ska gå och se. Ja, det beror ju på om du springer in på scenen. Ja, jag kommer springa runt en del så att det får bli en annan. Ja, det är en annan monitor. Jag tänkte inleda med det. Så att, du gör det ja, själv. Precis, ja, precis. Okay, mm. Ja, nu klockan tio över. Welcome to this class that will be taken in a little bit held in English. Now this is Per Axbo. Okay. Uh, hello everybody. It's uh, great to be here. Uh, I was a bit wary of speaking at a developer conference. Uh, I haven't been invited to one before. So um, uh, I'm actually really excited to be speaking at a developer conference because it means I'm actually speaking to people who often most use my work. Uh, usually I just preach to the choir, and that's not, not always as fun. Uh, okay, so we're going to start off by actually, I need a volunteer from the audience to uh, handle my cam for me during my presentation. Hand up one volunteer who comes with a book. <laughs> Hand up with you first. I'm going to be walking around a bit. And here's there's this book, actually. Uh, the book you wrote before it changed my life. It was called Pat and Back of the Napkin. This is Dan Rome's book. It's the sequel to the Back of the Napkin. It's called Blah, Blah, Blah. Uh, subtext, what to do when words don't work. And you'll see during my presentation why I like this stuff. Uh, so, uh, I'm one of these guys who, I like to experiment. Uh, I like gadgets. I like to understand people. I want to understand what changes people's habits. For example, I have in my pockets a Fitbit, which is a device that monitors how many steps, steps I've taken today. It's 6,819 steps as of yet today. Uh, it monitors my sleep. It connects to my WeThings scale, which is a wireless scale that's connected to my network at home. And talk, it, they talk to each other. And it also talks to RunKeeper. So RunKeeper knows my weight and how much I've slept and how happy I am. And uh, all that stuff I do because it changes habits, which is interesting. This is usually a UX person kind of an outsider, kind of alone in his or her role. Uh, but it's usually also that person's fault. Because what you, UX people tend to do is like, yeah, we're doing strategy work over here. We're doing you know, like wireframes, customer journey maps, and we're doing gamification. All these buzzwords that aren't really helping people understand what we're really doing. Uh, and we sit in meetings, we're always saying, <coughs> did the user want that? I don't think the user wants that. No, the user probably wants this. As if I'm sort of an expert on user behavior. Uh, I have lots of opinions about user behavior. All, all people do, but I want to have data about the users before I make any assumptions. 
And my role really is not to stand around and talk about users. It's, the users are not my target group. My target group is the developers. I should be helping developers and the site owners to understand how the work I do makes everything better. And I need to make life easier for everybody. My job isn't to make it more confusing. I don't want to give people more work. I want to make it easier to understand and get along with, with your work. That's me. And you really need to understand just one complicated word in this presentation, and that's hurdle. Does everybody know what a hurdle is? This is a hurdle. It's something you jump over in the isn't it 110 meters, usually, when you run hurdles? So it's like an obstacle. Something that's in your way when you're trying to run straight. You have to jump over it. I'm going to tell you now about an experiment that was performed in 1996 at Stanford University. And it's famously known as the radish cookie experiment. So uh, the researchers took two teams of students, let's call them like the purple team and the red team. And uh, the purple team of students, they, they were told they weren't allowed to eat anything before. Uh, they had, had to skip a meal before attending this research session. So, and then they came to the session and there were uh, bowls there, one bowl of radishes and one bowl of newly baked cookies. So, the purple team, they were told you can only eat the radishes. Eat two or three radishes, or, and you can't eat any cookies. It's not allowed. And they had to sit there for half an hour, 40 minutes. Red team, eat as many cookies as you want. Don't touch the radishes. And the experiment after that goes on with each team having to solve a puzzle, a mathematical puzzle, which is prepared so it's unsolvable. You can't really solve it. So what happens with the cookie people? The people who could eat cookies, as many as they wanted. They sat, on average, half an hour trying to solve that puzzle before they gave up. And the researchers told them, you can give up whenever you want. The people who weren't allowed to eat any cookies, the purple people, purple team, they lasted, on average, four minutes before they gave up and basically screamed at the researchers that this is nonsense that they want out. So what happened there? Rewards. Rewards. Actually, the researchers uh, took this to mean that uh, ego deteriorated, <laughs> deteriorated and uh, willpower is something, a resource that you can have a lot of and it can be less as well. And uh, you can actually work and change people's behavior based on how you, how much willpower you force upon them for performing any type of task, really. So what the cookie uh, people did, they were, they were so happy that they had eaten cookies, so they didn't have, had an exertion in willpower. But the radish people, they had already exerted so much willpower, they had no absolutely no uh, wish to continue with that puzzle, which by default was also unsolvable. So what does this really mean in, in the context of what I'm going to be talking about today? It means, and you know this really, if you fail at the first hurdle, the next hurdle is going to feel so much harder to get over. It's going to feel really, really hard. And I, I, I see this in my kids all the time. My, my, my eldest was in a table tennis tournament and he lost the first match. And just trying to win, I mean, he, he gave up after the first match and he had lost it. At other times, when he's won the first match, it's much easier to continue. And you know this by, just by waking up in the morning, having breakfast, and you spill something on your clothes, and you know, the rest of the day is ruined. It's common human behavior. So what does this really mean for uh, type of work we do. Well, basically, everything that we create 
is a hurdle to achieve a goal. Each field in a web form is a hurdle. It's something that's preventing me from reaching my goal faster. Now think about that each time you define a, uh, design a web form after this. Each form field is a hurdle. And one of the problems basically is that we're looking at this all wrong. We're focusing on form fields. But we need to zoom out. We need to zoom out and see not just the form field and the error messages. We need to zoom out and see the whole screen, the buttons, the interface. We need to zoom out and see the computer, because that has an interface as well. Some people I've used to test it with actually don't know how to turn on a computer. They just leave it in sleep mode. And the user is sitting in an environment probably where they're unfocused or they're stressed or they have lots of bills lying on the table as well. And really, how did they get to that web form? Was it through Google? Was it by talking to somebody? Or was it through an ad in the newspaper or the radio? All that affects how we should design the form. But how often do we actually talk about these things when we're designing the form? And what about what happens after? Is there supposed to be an email that goes away? Is there supposed to be a subscription to a newsletter? Somebody's supposed to call someone up based on that form? Or is somebody supposed to send a package? Yeah? Is there an echo? Yes. Yeah. Can, can we do something about the echo? Oh, but it's, it's the iPhone. Oh, it's this? No, no. It's, it's your band user that's run by running on the computer. It's the iPhone. It's that creating the. Because I have. Can we shut down the iPhone? All the sound on the computer, probably. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry about that. Is that better? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> Thanks. Rookie mistake. So, the interesting thing about this is we can design the best possible web form in the world, but if those things that the web form is supposed to execute, if they don't work, then we fail anyway. So we're just one small part of the puzzle. And really, what's the user thinking about? I mean, their, their ambition is not to fill out the web form. Remember, that's an obstacle. What they're thinking about is picking up the kids, having coffee with friends, making dinner, going on Facebook, paying bills, working out, making love, sleeping, reading up on news. That's what people do. They're not longing to fill out your web form. And also, what we tend to forget about talking about as well is building that web form, web form has to cost less than the value it provides. How often do we talk about that? <coughs> we use budget for new usability tests. Cost what they cost. And one of the basic problems is the user in relationship with the company has an experience. When well, you heard about customer journey maps, and this is a simplification of that. You come in with an impression and expectations based on what you've heard about the company from ads, from news, from television, from friends. You come in and you do an interaction. There's a result. You go away and you have an experience, good or bad. It's just one person having one experience with one company. But the company is organized like this. It's a marketing department, it's the web department, and it's the sales department. And those people don't talk to each other, do they? So the problem here is, the marketing department is doing things and creating impressions and expectations that the web team is not aware of and that the sales team is not aware of. And they're not telling, they're just telling them to build a web form, but why? And how are they coming to the web form? The only people who really know about what's happening is the customer service, but nobody talks to those people, right? I actually visited a site for, uh, for a project I'm on right now, just the other day. I visited customer support and I learned so much just talking for an hour with the customer support people, four people from customer support, and they told me loads. I've been in this project since October last year, and I think I learned more from them in one hour 
that I've learned about user uh, questions uh, in, the, in the prior months, which was amazing. And one of the things I found out, one, and one of the most uh, often calls they get, is actually people can't log out. It's an online health service where you have to log on. People can't log out. And the thing is, it's used by a lot of older people who don't know how to resize their browser. So the, the browser opens up real small. There's a left-hand navigation. And the logout button, of course, is on the top right. But that's outside the view. They have to scroll to the right and up to find the logout button. Something you don't really think about when you're designing for nice, beautiful screens and when you talk with designers. So what I've done is, I've used this for a lot of clients now, is I've simplified the user experience model for a lot of more people to actually start using it as a model for developing anything really, but online services specifically, in my case. It's all about the attraction. How do we attract people to the service? How do we explain what the service is all about? We clarify. How do we engage people to actually start using the service? How do we make it easy to use? How do we adapt to different pe people's needs? It could be disabilities, it could be that you're connecting to a mobile. How do we adapt? How do we create a reward that creates a feeling of wow? And how do we really extend that experience into something that gives us value and the users value, and helps us complete the circle by helping, having other people recommend our service which in itself creates an attraction. This is Frank. He's uh, my user tester. Uh, he, he does whatever I want him to, so uh, when I join him, as he completes the full circle of the ace R model, as I'm calling it, but we're changing it to hurdles. Because remember, each step of the way is a hurdle. So if we do something wrong along the way, it's going to be much harder to complete the next hurdle. So attract, clarify, engage, adapt, wow, extend. And let's talk about attract. What are the usual ways of attracting person, people to websites? They search online on Google, of course, but you also see a lot of ads with great copy and beautiful pictures. Of course, you can be recommended by a friend, which is really what companies are looking for. The problem is when the expectations presented in perhaps the ad or the sales text on Google in an online ad, perhaps. When those expectations are not met by the service they arrive to, that confuses them. For example, if you have a theater promising that you can subscribe to their schedule of events and plays, you're expecting to see a subscription service for us. To see an example of what this uh, uh, table looks like, or the newsletter looks like, whatever you're going to subscribe to. And you're already thinking about the plays you're going to watch at that theater. But if you're presented by a dull form, that's not going to, that's going to interfere with your perceptions and that creates a hurdle. That makes you less willing to actually go ahead and start a relationship with this company. And this is an actual, you don't have to be able to read what it says, but this is an actual subscription form for a theater in Sweden, just for subscribing to their newsletter. All these marked with a red asterisk, all those are compulsory fields, address, email, of course, but company, also, What's 2 plus 5? <laughs> Leave this field empty. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. How many subscribers do you think you have? <laughs> Expectations must be met. So he falls on his face. And he doesn't go on. It doesn't matter if the, the newsletter is really good. You can design an awesome newsletter. But if you fail here, you've already lost it. And you need to challenge that perception of users being lost earlier in the process. If you design something and build something and you think it's really, really good, think about how they get there. Because that's maybe why they're not using it. Maybe it is really good. But the step before that is just too difficult. 
And remember, the next row is much higher when you follow. Let's talk about clarification. This is a, something that a lot of companies miss out on. Clarify your offering. What is it you want me to do? What is it you want me to buy? What is it you want me to read? Why aren't you telling me that? Why are you just presenting me with so much information at once that it's hard for me to actually make sense of it? One common way of, of actually clarifying nowadays is video. <coughs> Create a short presentation video of your service. But that doesn't work for everybody because everybody doesn't even have four minutes to watch your, watch your video. So often, combination, it all depends. You have to do your research. But remember, there are different ways of clarifying. There's no magic bullet. There are different ways of clarifying what your service is all about. And this is one way. Provide a demo. A lot of internet banks do this. You can use the internet bank with a dummy account and try it out. So when choosing between two different banks, where I can actually try one service before registering, before becoming a customer, and the other one where I can't, I'm probably going to choose the one where I can try it already. Unless it really sucks and you don't really want to have a demo. Just providing a step-by-step -step guide. Picture, short text bullet points, number, probably the most efficient one. Blogger.com has a great example of that. Another thing is, you know how you can walk into a room and you forgot why you went into that room, right? Whenever that happens to you, think about how that applies to the web. Think about people opening a form and they forgot, why did I open this form? If you've ever seen people doing presentations, where you have side-by-side uh, -side forms and you ask people which one created the best conversion, how many, which one created the most people who signed up. It's always the one that reminded people of the benefits of the service. Just listing short bullet points, this is why you're signing up. It helps me <laughs> to not have to think too much. And it helps me if I stumble, if I'm interrupted by a colleague, and I'm on the forum and I thought, I'll do this later. I can't even remember why I'm here. Keep everything in front. This is what websites usually look like, right? Everything on the front page. Let the user decide what they want. And this is where everybody fails. This is actually an example of uh, where you have a step-by-step -step guide, create a new test, users complete your test, view your results. Sounds simple enough. It's called 5secondtest.com. I and a colleague had actually one question when we logged on to this. We needed a service that had ex exactly what this service was offering, but could we change it to not be five seconds, but to one minute? Could people watch our interface one, for one minute? But it was impossible to gather that from any text we were reading. We had to create an account to actually test the tool and see if it was possible. In that case, a demo would have been great because we tried a lot of other tools that had demos without having to create that account. So, stumble on our face again. So engage is, is really about the traditional, uh, well, the classic thoughts of what usability is. Um, making it easy for people to use the service. Having big texts, short texts, having the right support of images and diagrams, tables, putting, putting things in the right order. The things that make your website convert, that makes people buy, that makes people actually want to read, that makes it easy to use. This is just an easy example of something you don't really think about a lot, but can be a huge difference for some people. I'm certain that most of you guys in here, when you fill in forms, just use the tab, jump between fields. So many people don't even know if that's possible. They use the mouse and the keyboard. So here's one form, and here's another. They have the exact same fields. This form is easier for a lot of people to fill in. Because what they do is, they use the mouse to click there, fill in. They use the mouse to click there, fill in. They use the mouse. Oh, sorry. They, they, 
They use uh, the keyboard, the keyboard, they use the mouse, the mouse, the mouse, the mouse. You have the keyboard, mouse, keyboard, mouse, mouse, mouse. So they're changing the input device in one case. They're not having to change the input device as often on the other one. How many have thought of that before? Mm -hmm. Twitter's, you, you think that Twitter has had a great interface for forms. I misspelled my name. Name looks great. <laughs> you have to think about what you're writing. You have to test for all types of circumstances. This is actually a great example of, you know how a lot of forms when you sign up, you have to write the password several times, your email self address several times. What about finding problems before they happen? And this is a script that's actually available online for free. Just searching for common email address domain names and watching to see if, see if they're misspelled and catch that. Because that's a, a huge problem for a lot of companies. People signing up and they misspell their email address and they call up and ask, why didn't you get my stuff? Well, you entered it in the wrong email address and so on. So that's something that can save a huge amount of money, but it's a very, very simple script. Isn't it? Weird that everybody's from Afghanistan. When you sign up for stuff, Afghanistan is at the top. Wouldn't it be easier to have, actually have something that's more akin to where people are coming from? And every time I add an account to Google Analytics, it's so funny because Sweden isn't there. I have this habit of pressing T because it jumps down. To, I know a lot of people do this. It jumps down to Tajikistan, and I go up several steps to, and I go to Sweden, but it's not there. Why? It's on the top. It's at the top. Yeah. To make it easier for me. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so I scroll all the way to the top and try to find it. <laughs> if, you're, if you're not from Sweden, this is something that we actually happens a lot. So I have to fill in uh, state, but I'm from Sweden, I don't have a state, and so I get an error message and I can't continue. This is interesting. I, love, I know a lot of people have designed forms like this. All the form fields are empty, and I press submit by mistake. And it, it screams, you didn't fill out the fields. Duh. It's like I didn't realize. Yes. But you don't have to scream in my face with all these red labels. It's a common mistake. Don't make me feel bad. When you people talk about general failure, that's him. And it happens again. And it's so easy to create those hurdles and have people slip up all the time. And we haven't even bought anything yet. So let's think about adapt. What do I mean with adapt? And a lot of people are going to think of responsive design, yeah, mobile. Uh, well, it's all about seeing people and contexts, where people are. Just a few examples of how forms should be made. When I registered an account at Yahoo, and I entered the wrong date or the wrong year, the error message doesn't say, hey, stupid, you entered the wrong year. It says, are you really from the future? Isn't that beautiful? How often do you think about that? What you're actually putting in your error messages to make that simple piece of experience better. I love this. Well, this is embarrassing. <laughs> Firefox. It's, it's us who made the mistake, not you. There's a huge difference in how they're talking to people. Because the web is implicitly a dialogue. It always is. So how do you want to talk to people? Do you want to scream in their face? Or do you want to be funny? I'm always thinking about, if I wanted the web form to be somebody, it would be Chandler on Friends. That would, that would be fun. Just think about personifying your, your forms and your website. How can it be more fun? One way of adapting is realizing, well, these are different ways of adapting. Uh, I, I, I told you I'm working on a health service right now. And when people log on during nighttime, 
and he watched the contact cards for opening hours and telephone numbers. The computer knows it's night. Why even, what numbers should you really be presenting? If people are at home, feeling sick, feeling bad about themselves, write out the numbers that actually are open at night. So you can sense that people are logging on at night, they need numbers. You're sure you should provide the numbers in opening hours as well. But if you realize they are sending on at night, provide the numbers that are available at night. Because you know it's nighttime, because the computer has a clock. Location. I have a list to pick up uh, uh, Nespresso coffee, which you can only get in one store in Stockholm. And I don't always pass, it, pass by that. But every time I pass by, my task list tells me, hey, remember to get coffee. Because it knows where I am. It knows I'm close to the store. This is a native iPhone functionality, by the way. So it knows that I'm close. That's a much better way of reminding me than reminding me always by, by time and day. When I'm, so I'm, I'm close in the vicinity. Uh, another one that I love is uh, weather. I mean, external factors, any, any, any external factors you can think of. But weather in this case, an alarm clock I've been using, well, it can access weather services. So if it snowed at night, it wakes me up 20 minutes earlier so I can get my car out. Beautiful, isn't it? Thank you for waking me up. And you realize, realizing who people are, this is the guy who would love Are You Really From The Future uh, error message, right? People are people and people want to be, uh, want to have a dialogue like people and not with a machine. Of course, we have to mention mobile, right? Uh, when walking to this hotel uh, yesterday, I thought about when I opened the hotel website, it was all these fancy pictures and rooms and, you know, text about the hotel and why I should stay there, but I already had a reservation, so I, all I really wanted was the address to the map. You should still be able to access all the information, but think about what would pro probably 80, 70, 80% of people accessing through the mobile, what would they want at the top? Still have all the rest, but at the top, think about that. Wouldn't it be great if I could navigate? And it really told me the opening hours in case this was a store. And usually when you, you go to a store website and you set see opening hours, you have to read through it all and see, is, are they open right now? Well, again, it knows the time. You can have a big, big title that says, open right now. Thank you, I'm on my mobile, I'm probably close by. This is really interesting. Uh, I've had this happen. Can I get this delivered tomorrow? I've asked the company. One company says, no, I'm afraid that costs extra. The other company says, yes, of course. How would you like to pay for that? It's the exact same answer. Isn't it? Exact same answer. Except this doesn't create a hurdle for me. And this makes me land on my face. It's so easy to go wrong with words. I searched for London with two Ds. <coughs> what do we usually do when we design forms? The wrong, sorry, he misspelled that, try again. Or we build something that helps the user get to the right place. So challenge that perception of having error messages and having something that gets you to the right place, that helps you move forward instead of back. So how do we create rewards? How do we make sure that our website or our online service is much better than our competitors? Because anybody can do the other stuff that we just did. Well, no, well not everybody. So you see a lot of favorites there out there. But to really differentiate yourself, you need to create that reward, the thing that makes people come back. And one way is uh, add something extra into the mix, give something away. Give a discount. Sometimes I get an email from, uh, from Amazon saying that they've raised the price of something that I've had, uh, um, that, I had that I've told them that I want to buy eventually. And they say, you can still get it at the old price. I think that's beautiful. You still get it at the old price if you buy now. It's 
but the price is higher now. Just doing that well, it makes me feel a bit special. And personalization of, of anything, I mean, it's a multi-million dollar industry, just these colored shells for your phone. I have my, my phone engraved, of course, but just buying a color, I mean, that's the first thing my wife did when I got her iPhone, is buy a pink shell, a pink case. Because we want to feel that it's ours. And anything, anything that we can add to the website that makes it feel more personal, that's gonna help. But any kind of note that's even more personal, We've noticed you've bought a lot of books in this area. This is a recommendation we have for you. Amazon is absolutely amazing in this area. Recommending stuff based on stuff that I like, that I love. So watch your data and your logs and see what can you actually be offering uh, to people to make them feel special. And we have to talk about gamification. Oops, sorry. Gamification. Or game mechanics. Or whatever. And one classic example is, does everybody have a LinkedIn account? Yeah. Does everybody have it at 100%? No. 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 <laughs> Would you want to have it at 100%? No, is you shake your head. You don't want to have it at 100%. The thing is, the stats speak for themselves. You don't have to, you don't have to agree. But after they added that little bar showing how much of a profile you've completed, uh, the number of people who had complete profiles, it rose by an insane number, like two, 300%. It's just an easy way of adding something that's a feedback loop to well, people like me. I want to have it 100%. They did a change the other, I think just two weeks ago, and went down to 95, and I, Jesus, I went past there. It's just, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't know, I didn't even know what I had to add, but I added something, and I went up to 100 again. Did I, I, uh, this, this thing I have, Fitbit, it monitors my sleep, and uh, it gives me, I just love the name of this, Sleep effectiveness. Now that's something to compete with. I am, my sleep effectiveness is 93% with yours. I can be effective, efficient when I sleep. It's awesome. We can create games out of anything. Uh, of course, if you can be social and add, add, add that competitive element, that's always good as well. Mayor, maybe. I'm not a fan of badges and stuff, but it gets, seems to get some people's attention if, if your target group is in that segment. Sure. I've added on my website, when you fill in, fill in my contact form, I have a little monster that tells a joke. It's just so simple to implement, but it adds that extra fun that makes people remember. It's a reward. And of course, if you have Easter eggs, everybody know what Easter eggs is. If you have something that's hidden on your website that only some people can find, or if you can unlock something, if you're competent, enough times to get access to a specific area. Anything of that sort makes people feel, feel special. Uh, will work as a reward. But you have to remember that, again, people don't really want to be at your website anyway. Don't try too hard, don't try too hard, because what they really want to do is relax. And anything that you can do to actually help them, help them relax, that's what you want to do. Anything that you can automate, anything that you can make so simple that they don't have to spend very little time on it, that's going to have them coming back as well. Google thrives on this. Google wants you to spend milliseconds on their website and then go away, because that's what their business is. Because if they succeeded, then you got what you wanted. And extend. I mean, if you're, if you're failing at extend, uh, you're not doing your job, really. Because today is really simple. Uh, you have like buttons, tweet buttons, share buttons, but just don't have them all. You have to think about what are people going to be using on your site? What does your target group use? And I've, I've worked a lot with this and I've been usually, in Sweden, Twitter is not as big as in the States. So Twitter is not work working at all as well as I thought it would in the beginning. But so don't Clutter the interface with a lot of these buttons. Make sure you have the ones that matter. Allow people to give feedback. Are you happy with this? Rate this. People love giving feedback if given the option. But be sure you can handle it as well. Have people subscribe to your newsletter. If there's anything that reminds people of your service, it's a newsletter. Even if they don't read it, the newsletter makes a difference. 
just seeing your name in the email inbox reminds them, oh yeah, that company, they were pretty cool. Which helps them, helps you be top of mind whenever they need your service again. And make people contributors to your site. Have people actually be the innovators, thinking about new product ideas. Procter & Gamble have done, done this. They have a network called Connect & Develop, which means that uh, I think the numbers are something around 60-70% of their new product ideas come from this network of people who are not even working at their company. Make use of the people out there. And that's how you extend. And that completes the circle. Attract, clarify, engage, which is really about making the hurdles as small as possible. Adapting, giving that extra wow feeling, the reward, and then extending so that the circle goes on and on and on. But there's no magic bullet. You can just continue doing this. And you have to evaluate, of course, each, each implementation you do. So the name of my talk has been different in different ways, in different uh, programs, I think. Uh, six steps to master UX. If you use this model, you get a good idea of how you can think about the different steps of a user journey and what you should be doing in each step to promote the next step. But there's something else as well. There's one more step that I wanted to say, just mention. Consider something like this. So common. Just a requirement specification. I, I just loathe requirement specifications, by the way. Uh, what do you think when you see this? Can you build an upload form for Pokemon? Usually people think this. Well, all, all people don't think it looking like this. So then we spend, I don't know, millions, not millions, thousands, designing this form so that it looks good. It looks really nice on the screen. Well, consider this question instead. Can you help people share photos online? That's probably what the user was after, not some person's interpretation of what the user was after. And think about services like posters, where I actually start blogging by sending emails, where I post photos by sending emails, which people know how to use. It recently been bought by Twitter, by the way. Tripit, which I use for travel arrangements, I just forward my PDF, my itinerary, to them, and it automates the process of feeding my travel data into the system. I don't have to enter data in a form. Everything's done for me. This company, which I forget what it's called, uh, Juno, I think, uh, are designing a system where you can pay your bills by holding uh, your credit card up to the camera. You don't have to en enter all those numbers over and over. You can just hold up. And again, you're making it easier. People can stay in the hammock, relaxed. I don't have to be stressed out over all those numbers. I don't have to use that upload form. I can just use the things I'm familiar with. So the question, or step number seven really is, solve the right problem, which is the user's problem, not the thing that's outlined in the specifications. So always challenge that perception of the problem. This is what's in the specification, but what user problem made this into the specification? So this is my summary of my talk. Create superior websites by eliminating hurdles throughout the user journey. It's as simple as that and as hard as that. The first person to tweet this will get the nice book. <laughs> uh, this talk is online just now, live, and it's archived on that address as well. The slides are there as well, and I have provided a template for you for creating your own ace uh, experience model. And if you want to hook up with me, everything's on there as well. So, how do you feel about all that?
simple enough. Am I off track? What else? Anybody have an example of something they've had in a project that then made them think, think along these lines that one step ahead and we could have changed all this? First person to ask a question gets a flower. <laughs> or a piece of candy. How many developers are in here right now? How many people uh, consider them working, themselves working with UX? Half and half. It's been the same all day, I think. You can ask me any question. You can ask me where I'm raised. I, I was also raised in Africa. I think we should talk about that later. Yes. I was thinking about that with Google Analytics because I've been into that problem several times. I think I have certain websites registered on Google Analytics and every time I do that failure. I mean, yeah. there are two different users, the first time users and the expert users. You and me are the expert users. Yeah. Who should I favor? Uh, you should make it possible for, the, for, for everybody. You should make it as simple as possible. Uh, the best solution, you, I, see I gave her the book, not the flower, I over-delivered. <laughs> yeah. well, I think this, this is a common problem, that the expert user, if you think about more complex system than that web form, the expert user has other demands than the... Absolutely, I, I'm, all, I'm all for having, having interface stuff that, that are for expert users, but usually you can hide them in a way you can make them less uh, well prominent on the page. You can have them grayed out and have them, like Google. Google can do a lot of stuff if you use the search, search interface. So much stuff, but only if you're an advanced user you, can, you know about this. I mean, you, can, I mean, you can do maths, it can tell you the weather. Uh, it has Easter eggs. Have you typed tilt into Google? It tilts the whole interface. It's super fun. Uh, there's so much stuff in there, but they've kept the, the, the interface really simple, and they've adhered to that through the years. They just have that search interface, or that search field up top still. Although you can do all this, these neat tricks with, with the search interface. So, sure, adhere to the, to the advanced users, and don't make it all too simple as well, because most users are only in rookies for, for a while. But I'm, I'm all for having it as simple as possible and provide a separate area or a drop down, whatever, where you can access the advanced uh, options or keyboard shortcuts, anything like that. Be sure to, to do that stuff as well, absolutely. Yeah? You want to you want to design the user experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, Facebook is really special. I, I don't think. It, yeah, uh, not many websites. I mean, I think I see Facebook even as uh, like it's almost like for many people it's the internet. Uh, seriously, a lot of people just go on there and nothing else. So uh, it's it's hard to people get really upset when when Facebook do design changes, but they stay on there. You know that when people get upset for, by, with design changes, that means that that design is really good. Because if people didn't give a shit, excuse my language, uh, then they would just move on. They wouldn't talk about it. But if it's worth talking about, that means it's gone over the tipping point and so many people are already dependent on, the, on that site, so it doesn't really matter uh, if they complain about it or not, they're still gonna use it. Uh, if you, you reach that many people, but Facebook are designed, they're doing so much stuff all the time, so it's, it's hard to say what they're really doing. I mean, they're adding the timeline, so the people come, they add, people add their whole history so that you come sort of dependent on being there because you can't really export the data in a simple way. They're trapping us. Uh, so 
So there's lots of stuff going on there that <laughs> you could talk about a long time. But sure, you want to have a good website, sure, but most people aren't on your website. I mean, you, you need to have your, your hub, so to speak. I, I'm all for having your hub. I think that's where you should present your information. But then you need to shoot out that information into all the different channels where people are. So you shoot it out to Facebook, you shoot it out to Twitter. But don't rely on just having one Facebook page or one page on posters or whatever you do. You make sure you have the hub somewhere and you're in control of the information, then shoot it out because even Facebook is going to be replaced sometime. If somebody did tweet that and was first, I'm going to have to send you the book. <laughs> A challenge. <laughs> how long? How I mean, do you want the book or not? <laughs> That's another interesting thing. I mean, uh, with, if you have the LinkedIn uh, progress bar, it, it, it can't be too hard to reach 100%. It can't. It has to be. The steps have to be like incremental steps where you reach the next level quite easily because that means you've met, you've already made progress. So once you've made progress. You want to make progress again and again, so it becomes habitual. Yeah. That's what I was going to point out because I feel like I think I think I'm up to 80 percent, but I don't know how to get up to 100. Yeah, so they've made it too hard. I just don't care anymore. Yeah. I've, I've given up. You need recommendations. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you need three recommendations, and you're oh. up to <laughs> See, I'm all the way into the system. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it should be it should be clear to me what it is that I need. True. I agree completely. They're just happy about, because people are talking about their site at conferences now, so they're happy about that and they don't really innovate anymore. <laughs> they're doing other stuff. Okie dokie, I think we'll call that a wrap and uh, have a great night. Unfortunately, I'm not staying on tonight, so I'm heading up to Stockholm again, because my son's birthday is tomorrow. That's the way it goes, but I hope to be able to hook up with a lot of you uh, on Twitter and Facebook and whatever. Uh, I'm always available on chat and stuff if you want to have further questions <laughs> or think about something. Sure. Where can we find your slides? On that address. Oh. Everything's on there, even the video and the... <laughs>